you haven't been salmon fishing yet? You say the charters are all filled up, uh, everybody's booked, and you can't get in. Besides, you don't have the money. Hey, don't worry about it. If you have a small boat or have a friend who has a small boat, the salmon are in close all around Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, up, even up in Lake Superior, and you can fish from a small boat. I have a friend. His name is Sam Grissom, and he lives in Brighton. He has a small boat. He takes his kids out in this boat. I filmed it a couple years ago, and we're going to show you step-by-step step how you can do it. So join me, Fred Trost and Sam Grissom, for salmon fishing because it's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. Fish is out there for everyone. You don't need a lot of equipment and a lot of gear. Uh, the more you fish it, of course, the more gear you accumulate, but you can start out rather basic. Well, I think the best thing you need to start out with is a good, comfortable pair of pants, like Levi's or something you're going to be, if you want to wipe your hands on them, you can. Uh, Something that's not going to be too warm yet, if it does get a little little chilly, you do have some protection. You need a good lightweight shirt, uh, preferably long sleeves, so that you can roll the sleeves up, or if it sun's too hot, you can roll them down. And then a good jacket. In the morning you go out and come back in the evening, it can be quite cool. So you need something to knock that coolness off. I recommend a, a good leather shoe with a, a rubber sole similar to a tennis shoe. That way you've got the warmth that you don't have with a tennis shoe, plus you've got the safety so you're not going to be slipping as you're, you're playing a fish or when you lean over the side of the boat to rig your lines. But I definitely wear sunglasses because of the glare. Uh, some people like hats, I dislike them. If it does start getting nasty, I always keep a, a good parka in the boat. That way if it starts to mist rain or something, I can put the parka on and use the hood from the parka to protect my head. Well, I started out fishing with an open face spinning reel that I could put 15 pound test on and at least 200 yards. I found that way I could handle just about any fish that I wanted to and I matched it with an eight and a half foot rod that had a little bit of backbone and that way I was able to uh, move the fish when I needed to and uh, then you can just go from there and add as you go along. Probably the most important thing is you want to get that fish in a boat once you've played him, so you do need a good landing net. And it's best to buy the biggest landing net that you can find. And I found that that way when I do scoop down to pick up a fish, particularly if it's the kid's fish, you don't want to lose his fish, so you need a good landing net. Um, next thing you need is a boat that'll get you out in the water 30 foot deep. It's not necessary to have a, a big boat. It helps when you have to go out a long distance, but in the fall, they're in close. Uh, you can do it with a 12-foot boat. And of course, you just gauge it accordingly. You know, if it's bad weather, you wouldn't go out. The equipment that particularly identifies salmon boats are downriggers. These downriggers were developed to help Great Lakes anglers get their lures down deep where those hungry salmon are searching for food. Basically, all it is is just a reel capable of holding 200 feet of line, of wire line, 140 pound test. It has an arm that extends out to hold the weight away from the boat. It has a cranking device so you can raise and lower the weight to whatever depth you are going to fish at. Then most importantly, it has a quick release device of some type. There's probably a dozen different releases on the market, and everyone has their own preference. But it gives you a way of taking your line down. When the fish hits, it'll pull it free from the weight, and that way you're free to play your fish without any encumbrance from a heavy weight. There's been a lot of talk in fishing circles about depth finders, also called fish finders, and some people feel that without a depth finder, they don't have a chance of catching salmon. Let's see what Sam thinks. It's not really necessary. In the fall, they're in close enough that usually a flat line will get them. If you don't have one, you can run it out with just strictly a line out behind the boat, maybe crimp on a little bit of shot, and it'll get you down to the 
15 foot that would be necessary. Either that or if you do have the down diggers, um, you can ask a boat fishing next to you that's catching fish. People are very helpful. They'll tell you exactly how far down they're fishing, what lure, uh, what distance back from the boat, what speed they're trolling at. So really you can go up with a minimal amount of equipment and take fish. As the summer wears on, salmon become more cooperative and they move into shallower water just like at this time of year, but getting them hooked and into the boat requires some skill. The fishermen on a boat have to cooperate. Normally what we do on our boat is we try to fish at least three guys. It, sometimes it can be quite crowded, so you need one guy to maneuver the boat through the other, other boats, and you want to follow their lines. The second guy, his job would be to pull all the other lines out of the water. A big Chinook can turn and come right back on you. They might run out 100 yards, turn and come right back. So you want to try to get everything out of the water that's possible so it's not going to foul on your downrigger lines or foul on your other lines. And then it's more or less just hang on and man against fish for a while. The fish is a medium-sized coho, just right for barbecuing, baking, or even salmon boil, which we'll show you how to do in a few minutes. But unfortunately, on this day, the wind kicked up and stopped our fishing for the afternoon. But the next day, Sam's 10-year-old showed us how to catch a Chinook. I would say a six-year-old with help could, could take a fish. You're gonna have to hang on to the rod. Uh, you're definitely gonna have to hang on to the kid. Now, what I've done on my boat is I've hooked up some uh, all safety devices that I rigged out of a stringer that I snap onto my rods. That way I don't have to worry about my boys dropping a rod over the side. And then I just hang on to their belt just to balance them while they're manipulating the fish. And they'll get tired, but you, you help them when they need to, and then they've got the thrill, and they think that they've done it completely. Dave turned the rod over to his dad for a while, and you know those little arms do get tired quickly when they have to wrestle with the Chinook. But as soon as the fish started thrashing on the surface, Dave wanted to take over again. A few fish like this would bring smiles to the faces of a lot of fishermen I know, but for a youngster, catching a fish this size is a special thrill. And you know what happens next. They get salmon fever, and they'll be bringing home fish like this every weekend. We've got a good question for Fred, one of his favorite subjects. Here it's from Ron Robbins of Flint. He says, it was stated that if you built a fire, deer would stay away. Two years ago, me and my grandpa built a fire to keep warm, and we had 21 deer pass by. Four of them almost ran us over. My great-grandpa built a fire every year to keep warm and got a buck almost every year. We feel this is because the smoke from the fire covers up your scent. Ron, that question you asked is probably the most prevalent subject that we get questions on in our Deer Hunters workshops. We're going to be holding six of these around the state, and we'll spend a significant portion of time talking about this the deer's nose, what it can smell, what it can identify. And it's important to understand this before you draw a conclusion that smoke covers up 
your scent. A deer's nose is what really makes a living for this deer, keeps it alive and survives. A deer's eyes are important, but deers don't have, deer don't have that good a vision. They see things which alert them, but when they see something that alerts them or hears them with their oversized ears, hears a noise that alerts them to a danger, their nose starts working and they're sniffing to identify what it is. Now a deer can smell a number of things at once. Now, and I know when you think that a smoke covers up man's scent or maybe skunk odor, this is another popular one that's on the market. Put skunk odor all around your blind and it'll cover up your scent. Well, it covers up the scent to you because we, you know, human beings don't have very good noses for separating smells. Deer do. I talked at length with Clark Lincoln. He's done research up in Mount Pleasant on, oh, well, a product which he calls Scent Spence. It operates on the pheromones and glands of deer. He's done extensive research on the deer's nose, what it can smell, as well as he has a psychology background, too. He sort of put this together. You're going to hear a lot from Clark in future shows, but here's a little excerpt from the interview. I would think that a skunk scent in the woods would put all animals on alert that something threatening has happened. I think it would put a deer on edge rather than cover up your odor. I would think that it would, it would at the very least, you know, they, I, I think they, they must know that a skunk uh, triggers the odor when he's alarmed. Well, they wouldn't and even I, have to know that. Isn't I would, that just instinct? Well, I would think they would have put them on the alert, certainly, uh, that there might be something, like a lot of people say you should never smoke cigarettes when you hunt because a deer, aha, uh -huh, I smell cigarette smoke, there's got to be a human being nearby. They don't know what cigarette smoke That's is. right. They, 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 if, if you can think like it, they don't want to anthropomorphize and put human thinking into an animal. But if they could think, if I could think like a deer, I would say, there's something unusual there. Maybe I'll be a little bit more alert, but I'm certainly not going to put a train of thought saying, well, let me see, a human being is the only thing that smokes cigarettes. You know why smoking cigarettes alarms deer? Oh, I you ever seen a smoker in the woods? Movement, moving, the, the cigarettes moving, there's smoke puffing, he's lighting it, sure. he's twitching. You can see that a mile away. A little sure. white cigarette in the woods, is, especially you know, you when it's cool. Look around here. Look around here for something white. Sit in the woods sometime. You can't find anything in nature that's white except maybe cottonwood tree or uh, mm -hmm. little flowers. But white is so unusual to see. That's you know, right. and a little cigarette dancing in somebody's mouth. And the movement, I think, enters in that to a great deal, too. There's quite a bit of movement involved. Now, that is talking about smoking, sk skunk scents, uh, what alarm deer. So, you know, the conclusion is that deer can smell a fire, they can smell cigarettes, but at the same time, they can also smell many other things and they can sort them out very quickly. So what is the answer to the question, why the deer almost ran you and your grandfather over, Ron, while you were in the blind? You're talking gun season, probably opening day, the second day. At this time of year, there's a lot of hunter scent in the woods. Deer smell a lot of people out there and they sort of abandon a lot of their patterns. Uh, you were sitting undoubtedly in an excellent spot that maybe were escape runways for a number of deer and they were on their way through. They were probably alarmed by other hunters and they were on their way through. Uh, the fire, in all likelihood, had nothing to do with it. Now that's my answer. Now we can pick up on this and discuss it at our deer hunters workshops around the state. Now, here's a question. It might seem kind of facetious. <laughs> Let's take a look at this question in our outdoor quiz. Will music attract deer? Has anyone ever thought that music would? Well, it turns out that European hunters used to think music would lure animals into shooting range. You know, this type of thing is used in dairy barns to calm down the animals. And these European hunters would hire violinists to play from their deer blinds. No, no break dancing, just the violins. Thousands and thousands of salmon and steelhead fishermen know what this is. They should. It's a fish boil kettle. The fish boil kettle right here with, we have cooked up some salmon. We got off Ludington with Pete before his boat got struck by lightning. <laughs> <laughs> but here it is, fish boil. Swedish fish boil, as it's called. Scandinavian Great Lakes fish boil. Uh, as I dish this out here, Kath, what, what, how do you like to serve this? With butter and lemon? Exactly. Just... That's it, just butter and lemon. Melted butter, just pour it on. Now I'm going to run by real quickly how you make a fish boil. Fill the pot, and this is a special pot that you can fill with water. Put about 12 quarts of water in here, and then you add one cup of salt. Oh, that's right, that sounds like a lot. But you put a cup of salt in, bring it to a boil. You add your potatoes and carrots, if you want to put carrots in. Boil for 10 minutes. Add onions, boil another 20 minutes, so that's or 10 minutes, so that's 20 minutes total with your onions and potatoes. Add another cup of salt, 
That's two cups of salt we have in here. Sounds like a lot. Desert fish. And this fish, well, you can see the texture of it right here. Why don't you get this spoon, Kathy? Uh, the fish, the salmon, doesn't take long at all. Uh, that flakes right apart. Sure Look at does. that. Sure does. That's just succulent. And when you put butter on there, it, this is called poor man's lobster. It makes it taste like lobster or, or crab or shrimp. And it really does. It, it has it, it, all the oil goes out of it, and the oil ends up in the water, which is in the pan right here. Uh, the fish boil technique is something that people enjoy so much that they make too all the much. Time. That's right. And they make too much, and you end up with leftovers. Kathy, what is your solution to leftovers with the fish boil? In fact, let's save this. We'll feed it to the troops over here in a minute, okay. see how they like it. But now, what are you going to do with the leftovers? Make a chowder. Okay, or so. What I'm going to do is we emptied out this, okay. this pot. I'm going to put all the vegetables and fish in there. Now what? Take it away, Kathy. Okay, I'm going to add some milk. Let's add a cup of corn first, Fred. Small cup of corn. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay. Put add, your milk in. Add some milk. Just you can just kind of go according to how much you've got. Okay. You don't want to add a whole lot. You could put you some water in there too to cover the vegetables. Well, I wouldn't. You wouldn't add water. Point. Leave mm -hmm. it right with the milk. Right. Recipe some calls. Butter. The recipe calls for adding, adding some water. But this. Well, that's if you're going to cook more vegetables. Mm -hmm. But with this way, everything is all cooked. We've cooked everything first. Okay. We put the butter in there. Uh, I'm gonna, I have this burner on right now. Right. And the last thing that we add. Okay. We're going to need something to thick, thicken it up with. Add some cornstarch. Oh boy, this looks good. Milk, all the fish boil ingredients. Uh, we added some celery in there. How much cornstarch would you put in? Just you could just gonna have to watch it according to how much milk you put in. Go ahead, put it in there. Okay, and you don't want the milk to boil. You don't want to scald your milk. Boy, this looks good. Okay. Something to do with the leftovers from fish boil, our Swedish fish boil. Again, you don't have to have a special kettle like this, but it's mighty handy. You sure could, is. I've done it in a colander and a Dutch yeah. oven, but this, this makes is, it nice. It all fits together nice. Now, we're going to simmer this a little bit, heat this up, and uh, feed it to Bob and Ed over there. But first of all, Kathy, let's take a look at some of the big <laughs> fish that we all want to catch, so maybe we'll appear on the trophy report. Leading off this trophy report is a fellow who's special to us, a man who loves to fish. He's caught all kinds of salmon and trout in nearly three quarters of a century of angling, except a brown trout in the Great Lakes until last fall when a week before his 75th birthday, this 26 pound, two ounce Great Lakes brown hit his spoon off Arcadia. That made Robert Blow from Dearborn not only a master angler winner, but a world record holder on 25 pound test line. Bob couldn't make it to pick up his award at our sportsman's bank but last February, he had a stroke. And although he's doing better now, his doctors say he probably won't be battling any more browns like this one. But we know Bob's watching right now, and we want to give him special congratulations and wish him the best. He caught this trophy a year ago tomorrow. Bluegills, not the size of the 26 pound brown, but every ounce a trophy. One pound, four ounces on a night crawler. This 11 incher from Bills Lake in Nuego County made Dwayne Downer from Grand Rapids a master angler. And the minimum weight for a qualifying largemouth bass is six pounds. This one caught by Keith Pugini from Mount Clements barely made it, but it shows you that Lake St. Clair produces trophy bass during the summer. You know, the walleye were running quite small this year in Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie, but here's the whopper that every angler was hoping for. Don Jeanette from Livonia caught it on a crawler off Monroe, trolling at 7.30 in the evening, nine pounds, two ounces, 30 inches long. Wow. And here's what some Lake St. Clair walleye anglers came up with this past summer as they were drifting beetle spins mid-morning. One hungry muskie, a shade over four feet long and four ounces over 26 pounds, a trophy for Jerome Nisel Sr. from Detroit. And even though his son Butch shares the spotlight by holding the muskie's tail, we're going to make Jerome Nisel Sr. our Michigan Outdoors Master Angler of the Week. Looks good, Kath. There's the mighty, chowder. Part. Mighty thick chowder. It is. So you can dish that up and get Bob started on that. Here is the fish boil, as it was uh, often as the day before, and I'm going to scoop some of this onto Ed's plate right here. Mm. Onions, potatoes, a little bit of celery in there. We, we put it in there too. Now hold it, Ed, before you get going oh. on that, some lemon butter. Absolutely imperative. All right. You gotta have it for that. Now try that. See how that fish boil is. We're going to scoop up some chowder. 
How's the chatter, Bob? It's my favorite. It is? <laughs> You know, it's, it's such a neat thing to be able to do with salmon is to, and, and, and when we've tried this recipe, let's be honest about it, we tried the recipe on people and they just have rave reviews. Oh, it's yeah, one of the real favorites. Yeah, how's the fish boil? It's great. Now, what is in that sauce? Is that Lemon just, and butter. Oh, boy. That is good. Well, it's always good. We, last That's week right. with the walleye, it was basically try some mm. of that chowder. How did, how did you mix that? Uh, equal parts? Lemon, lemon and butter, or what? A little bit of lemon, a little bit of butter. Oh, Come right. on, Bob. You know, <laughs> that's the way you do it in the kitchen. <laughs> anyway, really this recipe coming out in our Club Digest, which will be out within a week and be in your hands, those of you subscribers. And, uh, well, it should be pretty close to a week. Mm -hmm. By next week's show, many of them will have it in their hands. And this is for our fish boil and our chowder, which you get an A in, Kathy. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. A plus. You know those little arms do get tired quickly when they have to wrestle with the Chinook. But as soon as the fish started thrashing on the surface, Dave wanted to take over again. A few fish like this would bring smiles to the faces of a lot of fishermen I know, but for a youngster, catching a fish this size is a special thrill. And you know what happens next? they get salmon fever, and they'll be bringing home fish like this every weekend. 